I'm here to tell you the reason why we have to redesign the education. That's me. Six, 1966, I have just started my school, and there was a big debate in Finland about renewing our education. Those days we had, uh, and I have understand too that the German system is a bit similar. So we had a, a system where we had four years elementary education for all the kids, and after that you either choose grammar school or went to so-called false school. And the new idea was to have a comprehensive school where all the kids, irrespective of their background, would be sitting in the same class, be taught by the same teacher. Just imagine, like having all, placing all the kids in Einheitsschule. So, those who were against this reform, and there were many, argued that nothing good can come out of putting these kids together. And if someone has asked me, this seven-year-old learner, I might have given the same answer. I was a bit bored at school, uh, and especially when we had reading. I have learned to read when I, two years before I went to school. But those days, it was almost a crime to know something that the teacher has not taught you. So there I was, sitting in my class, trying to hide my reading skill and hating those lessons. My experience as a first grader definitely did not support the idea of having all the children in the same class from one to nine. But I was wrong as those against this reform. What Finland did 40 years ago was quite radical. There was the great vision of offering equal opportunities to every child, irrespective of their background. And those behind this reform, they understood that for Finland to be successful in future, we can't lose any potential that we are having amongst our children. Parents, they were quite suspicious about this reform. What would happen to our grammar sons and daughters when they are sitting with those less privileged and less talented? And the teachers, especially those who were teaching in the grammar school, they were terrified. How can we cope with such a diversity of learners? But they did. What they have to do was to change their practices and get better understanding of different learners. And Finland became a success story, a model country for education. Year after year, our young ones have been on the top of PISA evaluation, and the learning gap in between the weak and well-performing is the smallest amongst OECD countries. So you may expect that my talk today is about our success story and how you should do it. But it's not. I'm here to tell you why we in Finland have to redesign our education. It may be hard to believe that Finland, the leading country for education, is in need of redesigning it. But let me tell you why. I'm a fortune teller for the school. And my job is to look how the school will be in 20 to 50 years. We have this shiny sugar iced cake called school. It looks beautiful, but it may not be healthy inside. How many, just imagine. The children, if you have children or grandchildren that has just, just started their school, so they will be in the labor market 2070. And we don't even know what kind of jobs we are going to have them. As we have heard this day, automation, robots can easily replace even the experts. In the future, it may not be me giving this TEDx talk, but a robot that looks like me and sounds like me. And the, by the way, how do you know that it's not the case already? <laughs> anyway, this technology already exists. 
But our current school, it was designed for the industrial er era, for the need of industrial, industrial society. Time of mass production, of routine works, and specific jobs, professions. And that world does not exist anymore. So I have recovered that there's a huge gap in between how our school is operating today and with the real life. Let me open up this a bit. Information. As we know, information is everywhere. It's spread to the webs. Uh, anyone can modify it. Anyone ha has access to it, uh, irrespective of what we just saw in the beginning of this session. So if you Google a question and push the bottom, so at least you get some answers or some in information. But yet in school, we are acting as the teacher is the holy grail of wisdom, the gatekeeper of knowledge. When I graduated to be a teacher, it was 1999. So my cousin told her little kids, remember to behave, Mario is a teacher now, and she knows everything. What a confidence in teachers, but not a proper picture for the future learners. And digitalization, it's changing and will change our ways of uh, life and, and work and communication in a way that we have can even not imagine today. And what do we teach in the school? Be obedient, follow the rules, cope on your own, do the things at the same time, in, at the same rate, at the same space. This list could go on and on, but just look here. A classroom, 1800s, 1940, 1966, me there, and today. Can't see a lot of change there, can we? Unfortunately, the setting in the classroom has remained almost unchanged since 1800s. And I'm afraid this is illustrating something more profound. We are repeating our traditional procedures of teaching and not preparing our young ones to the future. Let me ask you a question. Would you go to a doctor that is still is using the technology from last century? Or to a dentist that have a dental drill from the early 1900s? I wouldn't. But at the same time, we are quite content to let our children to attend a school that was designed for the last era. So, what's the school then for? What the future school should be? Oh, it's not working. Oh. <laughs> Let me first tell you what it is not. Some years ago, my son, he was the sixth grader then, came home and said, you know, mom, today I really succeeded at school. And I was thrilled what he has learned, what he has discovered. You know, we had this self-evaluation thing and in school, and I could guess exactly what the teacher was expecting me to write down in that paper. I was shocked. Is this what we are teaching our children? To guess what someone else is thinking, in this case, the teacher, to guess the right answer? No. We shouldn't. Instead, we should teach them critical thinking, to be brave and creative, to have flexible mind. And moreover, we should ask, why do people come to school to learn? Actually, I was asked this question by a 10-year-old boy when I was still a teacher. He didn't see any sense of them coming to school and filling up the exercise books there alone. We could do this as well at home alone, as this young fellow very cleverly pointed out the issue. And that made me to rethink my practices and the meaning of the learning. Pupils, they gather together at, in school, so they should do things together, not alone. And the learning, it should be meaningful for our pupils. They should know what they are learning, why they are learning the things, and how do they learn in the best way. And actually, that's my third critical question for the future school. How do pupils learn 
Do you have children or grandchildren? How many of you, please? And they do have mobiles, laptops, tablets. They are very fluent with them. They are happy playing with them. They are connected with their friends through, through social media. They learn things by playing games like Angry Birds. That's from Finland, by the way. Uh, my sister is the cra uh, grandmother for a two years of granddaughter. I, I have watched this little girl, how she is fluent with the mobiles. She was one year and some months old when I wanted to make a bit closer acquaintance with her, so I showed my mobile. There was a picture of giraffe. And what did this little girl do? She used her tiny little fingers just in the proper way to enlarge the picture. And she even knew how to shift to the next one. I was amazed. And you know what happens in Finland in our schools, what we see, is that our boys today, they are more gifted in English language than our girls, and it used to be the other way around. What have our sons and boys done? They have played games online, they have having fun with their friends, and they have learned new skills. But what happens when these digital natives enter to class, in worst case? Close your mobiles, sit still, look forward. No wonder they lose their motivation. My exp experience as a first grader is the tiny reflection of what our kids are experiencing in school if we are not changing our practices. So this all has made me to rethink our education and, and understand that we really need a new narrative for our education. And one very practical tool to make the change happen in classrooms is so-called phenomena-based learning. It means that instead of pupils studying incoherent pieces of knowledge from the books, they are tackling with the real-life problems holistic entities. We are practically scrapping the traditional subjects. Life does not consist of subjects, so why should learning? And the role of the pupil is different. They are active in their learning, in their planning, learning, and evaluating processes, instead of obediently following up what the teacher tells them to do. And the focus is in learning, not in teaching. Learning must be meaningful for the pupils. They have to understand why they are do doing things and how these are connected to their lives. Let me give you an practical example from this spring from one of our schools or areas in Helsinki. A phenomena suggested by the pupils, something that the pupils have in their surrounding and they are interested to study, was a smartphone. And these young children, they were full of ideas what they can study, studying the smartphone. History, we can study history, the history of telephone, how it has developed during these years. Spelling, we can study Finnish language, how SMS and WhatsApp are changing our la written language. We can have maths and science, uh, statistics here. We can make an inquiry, ask people how do they use their phones, and make us made statistics out of that, and so on and so on. These children, they were full of ideas, eager to start their learning journey, lessons that they won't forget. So, my suggestion for the future school, what it should be, are these three critical things. First, focus on learning and anchor it to real life. Learning must be sensible. It must make sense to our children, and it has to be connected to their real life. Customize learning, but connect it at the same time with the collaborative work. We have to plan more individual learning paths for our kids so that they don't lose their potential, but we have to do it in a way that it at the same time promotes their ability to work together with different learners, to build knowledge together, and to strengthen their social skills. And thirdly, be digital. 
Learning happens everywhere. You can't capture it in, inside the school. Just utilize the variety of different learning places, public, private, virtual, physical, museums, uh, theaters, uh, shopping centers, uh, muse uh, parks. That's where people can learn. And it can be fun, exciting, and brave learning. So I believe, if doing so, so in some years' time, there will be another seven years older first grader, just I, like I was some decades ago. And what I want this kid to experience is a school where everyone loves learning. Learning is fun, it makes sense to them, they understand what they are learning, and they are experiencing exciting learning places. They are bold to achieve whatever they want to achieve. They are facing their future with brave minds. This is my vision. Thank you.